Back in the early days of Brick City, before 600 had formed as a Black Disciple gang set, some members like 600 Breezy and Lil Boo would actually consider themselves to be GDs or Gangster Disciples. And Lil Boo could even be seen in several throwback pictures throwing up the rakes, the pitchfork hand sign that signifies GD membership. The makeup of Brick City was really a result of changes in the way that Chicago gangs were structured around this time, by groups of people from the neighborhood with various different gang ties. As a result of the demolition of the large public housing project in Chicago, displacing many of the traditional gangs that had previously been grouped closely together in their respective housing projects. In Brick City's case, there were black disciples like the brothers E-Day and C-Day, as well as others who originally hailed from the building at 6217 South Calumet that was called the Randolph Towers, also known as the Castle or the Met Building. This was a 16-story project building that acted as a black disciple stronghold before the leaders of the gang were indicted and the building was eventually demolished during the 2000s. Some of 600's members, like the 600 founder D Thang and his brother M Thang were also Black Disciples, who came from Parkway Gardens, known in future as Oblock, but at the time known as Wick City, while others, like D Rose, would actually have ties to the Black P Stones out of Motown. And S Dot and 600 Breezy belonged to a set called Evans Mob around 79th and Evans Avenue, with S Dot's family having a Black Disciple background and 600 Breezy's family having a heritage in the Gangster Disciples. However, 600's ties with the Black Disciple side of the gangs in the city would become stronger over time, as they formed new bonds with the nearby Black Disciple sets such as Front Street, O-Block, Blackgate, and Lamron. And while the rivalry between the GDs and the BDs would certainly make a comeback as each of these factions gained prominence in the Chicago drill scene, but despite Lil Boo's background as a gangster disciple, he's actually credited with being a founding member of 600 together with d Thang, and therefore was one of the most loved and respected members despite his heritage in a supposedly rival crew. Tay 600 would actually describe him as the godfather of 600, breaking down their relationship in videos on his YouTube channel. Lil Boo is directly responsible for why I'm 600, so it was only right, you know, that I come and give y'all this story time on, on one of the fathers of the six. Lil Boo was, of course, he's an original, he's one of the originators of 600, you know, him and D Thane, they came together and they made this thing, you know what I'm saying? Him and D Thane, they was best friends, you know, back in the day. They was right in between that age range where they was like E Day and Trigger and Stello. They was like under, they was like they age, but they wasn't they age. They was like old enough to be like little bro and them and be around them, but they wasn't really like they age to do everything that they was doing at the time. You know what I'm saying? And they told me like that's what made them to basically coming and making their own block because. They looked up to really ain't want to get on their own shine yet, and they got tired of, you know, sitting back in the cut, you know, just being a little bro now, you know what I'm saying? They wanted to be something. They wanted to be the face of something, you know what I'm saying? That's how 600 came into play. And when that decision got made, Lil Boo and d Thane they put their heads together and they made that decision to jump off the porch and do 600 business. You know what I'm saying? Not continue under the Brick City Act or the um, Gunland Act or the Rockstar Act or the Members of 600 like Tay would claim that they were personally recruited and trained by Lil Boo, who actually showed them to ropes to gang lifestyle in the area, even making these young members so tough that even as teens, they would be able to hold their own against elders and have no fear of their rivals in the area. I'm sitting in Booker Room, uh, Lil Boo sitting right there, he unjamming, he, un he cleaning the pipe, dismantling it and all that. He looked over at me he like, yeah, so Tay, you ready to get with it, boy? I'm looking at him like, like you feel me? Like that look I just did, I'm giving him that look. Like, you feel me? I'm damn. Okay, cool. What that mean? Booker like, man, he asked me if you ready to get down with this 600. You know, that was my ingratiation into like, all right, are you really 600 for? And one thing I really could say about Lil Boo for was when he put me in, he actually took that time. This was a lot of that get on the streets now is missing. When he put me in, when he got, when he recruited me and he put me in, he took the time to teach me, you know what I'm saying? Certain, like how to move, how not to get killed out here, fo. Like Lil Boo was like, he, he wasn't gonna let me fail, fo. I ain't gonna lie, like, he, he took my hand and was like, no. You can't do this, little bro. You can't do that, little bro. You gotta walk like this, little bro. 
You got to look this way and that way, little bro. You got to hit this cut. You just can't be on the strip all the time, little bro. You got to find you a back street. You got to do this. You got to do that. However, one thing about Lil Boo that kind of confused the younger members of 600 would be his love life. Because despite teaching them how to move militant so that they could survive the gang war in the streets, Lil Boo himself was known to be in a risky and controversial relationship with a girl named Booby, who actually came from the hood of one of 600's longest enemies, Gyro City, whose member Dome had in 2011 killed D Thang, who was Lil Boo's best friend. I get my kid, we gonna move far away from this. It's had a shit. Bro. I get my kid, we gonna move far away from this. Mm -hmm. Oh, I wow, peep. No, 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 me. Gay. Hey, got my good, but it's close. Oh, detail gets close. Mm -hmm. My sister got a deuce, deuce on the bar. <laughs> oh, detail, how good this girl? I should have asked for it, but I don't, need that. I don't trust you. Start going booby. Now, let me make, let me make sure I tell y'all. If y'all don't know who the backstory on booby is, booby is a girl from Jarrow City. Um, she was killed in like 2015 or 16. I don't know, one of them years. But she was a op, and um, she was like, and this is no disrespect, but booby ass was popped. Booby ass was popped. I ain't smoking on booby. I don't got nothing negative to say about her. I don't throw no extra unneeded shade. But booby ass was snap, crackle, popped. And folks used to be eating that and head over heels and kissing her, tonguing her down and, and pictures and all type of grabbing that ass and like getting to old folks and them about her. I'm just like, ooh, I'm bitty. I'm like, ooh, I'm bitty. Folks ass a freak on folk gray. And to make matters even more confusing, Dome was allegedly Booby's big brother. Lil Boo's relationship with Booby was not only problematic because she came from a rival hood, but because she actively participated in gang life and street politics. And on her social media, she could be seen actively repping rival gangs to 600 like Jaro and 051, throwing up gang signs, including cracking the trays to diss the Black Disciples, as well as shouting out some of 600's biggest ops like LA Capone's killer Lil Mick from 051, as well as D Thang's killer and her brother Dome, as well as being seen toting guns, seemingly ready to catch ops by herself. But moreover, she was also known as a so-called setup chick, a girl who would act like she was romantically interested in another gang member just to lure him into their ops clutches. Now, particularly because of this, Booby was considered to have been an active participant in the gang war, and she had a target on her back, a target which could unfortunately pull Lil Boo into the crosshairs too. And despite Lil Boo himself now having an opportunity to use Booby to catch his ops, he refused to take advantage of her, as the couple genuinely appeared to be in love. You know, Booby was a real lie, like phone was calling her setup queen she was like a top op like top female op who was trying to kill her she was out here looking for booby fo and we steady telling blue boo slow ass like fo you want to be with her when they when looking for her find her fo then well that's looking for her when they find her. what you gonna do you gonna smoke a about booby bro this man was dead ass like he loved her he went back doing booby. He wouldn't even try to get booby to back door none of the ops. That's how much he loved her. He just wanted her to love. He, they just wanted to love each other. Being from rival gangs in an area that had turned into a full-blown war zone would naturally cause some tension in the relationship. Booby would even tweet how she sometimes needed to sneak Lil Boo and other 600 members out of her hood due to 600's ops like FBG Duck, Dooski, and 051 Melly all wanting to kill them. Lil Boo's ops would also try and get to him by attempting to expose Booby for cheating. And sometimes, guys from Booby's side of the war would even seemingly threaten her to stop seeing Lil Boo or they would end up both getting killed. But throughout it all, although they were never seemingly exclusive with each other and their relationship would go through its ups and downs, they would continue to publicly display their love and even defend one another to their fellow gang members, essentially becoming a sort of Chicago version of Romeo and Juliet. But sadly, in 2015, this relationship would come to a tragic end, as both would end up losing their lives. On the morning of the 3rd of April, shortly before noon, Lil Boo was walking down South King Drive in 600's neighborhood when a gold-colored car reportedly drove up next to him. A man would then exit the vehicle, proceeding to shoot Lil Boo, real name Jerome Anderson, multiple times before getting back into the car and fleeing the scene. Lil Boo would be left for dead in the street, laying next to the back wheel of a parked car, with a viral image of his body laying next to the car's rear tire, leading to his enemies to refer to him with the disrespectful nickname Tirehead. Meanwhile, only about half an hour after Lil Boo had been killed, 
Booby would post on her Twitter, seemingly upset that Lil Boo wasn't answering his phone, unaware that the love of her life was lying dead on the street, just about a half mile away from Jaro's hood. Following Lil Boo's death, his friends would post their tributes on social media, including his old friend Chief Keith, who had practically been a member of 600 himself. 600 Breezy would also post on social media, reminiscing about his fallen friend, and not so subtly hinting that the reason he was killed was because Lil Boo himself had killed so many of the Ops. Later in 2016, Breezy would even claim that Lil Boo was in fact killed by four shooters instead of just one, and inferring that his killing was a setup. Indeed, online rumours would later spread that four members of 051 had orchestrated the hit. However, police reports posted on Reddit would seemingly suggest that it was only one shooter who confronted Lil Boo, shooting him to the ground and then standing over him. Given Lil Boo's fierce reputation in the streets, as time went on, his enemies would take delight in dissing him. For example, infamous gangster disciple from STL, Wooski, would diss Lil Boo relentlessly in his song Computer's Remix, as would FBG Duck on his Exposing Me remix, where he referred to him as the long-running, disrespectful nickname Tirehead. FBG Dutchie would also be seen in an interview with Wooski disrespecting Lil Boo and breaking down how the murder happened and telling the world exactly why they call him Tirehead. Can I ask you guys about the the situation where you guys say Tirehead? Can I ask you where that comes from? Tirehead. Hey, watch yeah. out for that car! Okay. Hey, this is what I heard on the street. I don't know about no, no money. Okay. They said some funny ass got smoke. Okay. Smoke. When he got smoke, he tried to run. The damn fell by the car. They walked up on him and finished the mold. And it's oh, on the side rock. By the tire. Okay, now was this from the other side? This is one of the, one of the funny guys. Oh, okay. 051 Driller would also make fun of Lil Boo's death by tweeting on the 1st of November 2015 how his friend was going to a Halloween party as Lil Boo, with his friend literally holding a tire to their head. Already less than a month after Lil Boo's death, Driller from 051 had tweeted implying how Lil Boo, LA Capone, and Trix were all killed by his gang 051. FBG Duck's brother, FBG Brick, would also share a picture of Lil Boo's dead body on Twitter, claiming, this is what happens when you smoke Tuka. And the Chirac scorekeeper, Mubu Crump, who had once upon a time actually been friends with 600 and their associates before aligning with 051, would take the disrespect to new levels by describing the murder of Lil Boo during one of his IG lives, saying that Lil Boo had begged for mercy while he was hiding behind the car before being shot 40 times. Crump would also claim that 051 don't even bother sliding on 600 anymore because they've taken so many losses and are hiding behind THF 46. Hey, on, on 4 no, no, look right. On the real, I ain't gonna even start like, Lil Boo got hit 40 times. He hollering up under a car like, please don't do this to me. Please, please, please. The six got so many dead guys, it don't even make no sense. Like, no, no flex. Like, we don't even slide on the six no more, bro, because y'all ain't even on the real. Like, it's to say, we be four six of them, y'all hiding behind them. And it's crazy. Like, E Day, like, you the lost rapper of the BDs. Like, your guys don't even with you. Like, you so. You a truck driver, bro. But no one would post about Lil Boo more than Booby, who was devastated by this loss. At around 12.43 p.m., just over an hour after Lil Boo had been shot, she would post several pictures of the couple, together with text, that gives the impression that at this point, Booby still believed that Lil Boo might survive the shooting. She would also have an outburst against all of the people who were seemingly talking about her and Lil Boo's relationship in the aftermath of the shooting, saying how she had love for both her gang set and Lil Boo and she would seem to be in a state of disbelief about what had happened. And in the following days, she would tweet countless posts all about him, saying how she knew that Lil Boo had other girls, reminiscing about all the times they'd spent together, posting pictures of their FaceTime calls, and even seemingly implying that she was somehow still talking with him. It would seem that Booby's mental health was taking a major slide after losing Lil Boo. Still, in August 2015, she would tweet how much she missed him, together with another tweet of a screenshot of somebody's phone screen, with a background photo of Booby and an incoming call from somebody named simply an engagement ring emoji. This would be Booby's last tweet about Lil Boo, because in the beginning of September, while Booby was at a party in Jaro City's hood that was being thrown in honor of one of their most beloved fallen members, Crack, aka P5, with King Von allegedly playing a role in the murder, a fight would break out. Shots were fired, and one of these shots ended up hitting Booby in the head, with her being pronounced dead in a hospital just an hour later. A few days after Booby's death, the Chicago Tribune would write an article about her where they would interview her mum and sister. And in this emotional piece, her family would tell how Booby was hanging out with people she loved dearly, but they didn't love her back. And although there were numerous people who witnessed the events that led to her death, nobody would come forward and talk to the police. And the article would end with words from her mother, who explained how Booby loved and trusted hard, and it was ultimately these qualities that ended up being her downfall. Within the same year, this cursed Chicago couple had both lost their lives due to gang violence. Two gang affiliates from the wrong side of the tracks, who met dramatically tragic endings, like a true Chicago Romeo and Juliet story. 
But this is real life, and the death of this couple from opposing gangs would leave members on each side mourning bitterly. The murder of Lil Boo was a particularly huge loss for 600, and now both of 600's original founders were now dead. A huge void was left in the gang, and unfortunately, the slew of losses didn't stop there. And in just three months, another older and well-respected member of 600 would wind up being killed in brutal fashion. In 2015, Stello was in his mid-twenties, and really would be considered an OG by Chicago street standards, where few members survive even past their teenage years. And due to his older age, Stello repped both 600, as well as the earlier name for the gang set in the neighborhood, Brick City. Surviving for this long in some of the most dangerous streets of Chicago is a small miracle, but unfortunately, if you stay on the streets long enough like Stello, it's only a matter of time until it's your turn to go out. According to police and news reports, on the 21st of July 2015, Stello was driving his car with two other occupants at the intersection of 59th and State Street when he stopped at a red light. At the time, 59th Street acted as a border between the hoods of 600 and MOB, with both sets known for repping that exact street. And while being stopped, someone would reportedly spot him from another car, with at least one gunman appearing and beginning to shoot towards Stello's vehicle, while an additional gunman would begin shooting from the sidewalk, with one bullet hitting Stello in the back of the head, killing him on the spot. Ruger from MOB would later mention the circumstances of Stello's death in disrespectful terms in his verse on the Exposing Me remix with FBG Duck, where he would rap how the shooter left Stello's head in the back of the seat. Meanwhile, the passengers in Stello's car would actually return fire after escaping and fleeing the scene before the arrival of the police. And in later footage from the crime scene, Stello's silver Dodge Charger can actually be seen on the side of the street whilst detectives were combing through it. Interestingly, this was the same Dodge Charger that can be spotted in an old Zack TV video documenting 600 in their hood, a clip that was posted in May of that same year. And in the video, Stello speeds past in the car, which leads fellow member Just Blow to think that it's actually an attack from the Ops as he ups his gun ready to shoot. But luckily, Ide recognizes the car as Stello's, whilst a young famous can be heard saying, it's Stello, he always does that dumb stuff. That's what it is, man. Oh. Unfortunately, Stello's personal car being seen in a prominent hood vlog about 600 with thousands of views may well be the reason that his enemies were able to identify him in traffic. Although it's possible that the Ops had been aware of his car for a while, because already in January 2015, Stello would post on his Facebook how somebody had shot at him. But anyway, about one hour after the shooting, 600 Breezy would comment on Stello's passing on social media, confirming his death and acknowledging the importance that he and Lil Boo had played in the group. In 2021, Take a Pone would write a heartfelt tribute to Stello, explaining how he had bridged the gap between the older and younger members of 600, and reminiscing just how much he had enjoyed the street life. Even Chief Keef paid his respects a few days after Stello's death, followed by a description of throwing up the hand sign that 600 were known for, which can be seen as a disrespect towards their biggest ops 051. The Chicago Tribune would report about the killing the following day, already acknowledging Stello's connection to 600 and describing how people in the area were expecting retaliation. It had been rumored that MOB's top killer, Bebe, may have been the one responsible for this hit, but the retaliation would come in directly, and much later. Over a year after the murder in September 2016, a man named Eric Banks, who was known in the streets as E-Boy from MOB, would be shot to death in MOB's neighborhood, targeted by a gunman who would exit a vehicle and run down E-Boy and his friend while shooting at them, and this gruesome killing would be caught on a nearby surveillance camera. After the death of E-Boy, aka Banks, the investigation into Stello's murder would be updated, with a report naming him as one of the suspected shooters who killed Stello, with Stello's murder case therefore being considered cleared. Then, in 2017, two men would in turn be charged for the killing of E-Boy, aka Banks. These men would turn out to be members from THF 46, a set from the low end known for its close ties to 600, with their names in the streets being known as THF Tay Tay and THF Gucci, who can actually be seen posing with D-Rose from 600 on his Instagram, as well as showing ties to other 600 members on Twitter. Ultimately, as the years went on, the golden era of 600 and their prime between 2012 and 2014 as the most buzzing rappers in Chicago drill was becoming a distant memory. And moving on to 2016, the energy around this crew would get more and more negative, culminating in November with one of the most brutal and unexpected incidents concerning a 600 member who snapped on his own family and did the unthinkable. Bitedown is a lesser known member of 600, an occasional rapper who had his own aspirations in music. Body dropping the mixtape coming soon. Yeah. Oh, that's what it is. Body dropping the mixtape coming soon. Oh, that's what it is. Body dropping the mixtape coming soon, man. That's coming, B. Body dropping the mixtape coming soon. Body 
Oh, Bite Down had a seemingly close relationship with the notorious killers King Von and T-Roy from Oblock and could be seen hanging with them on social media. Bite Down himself was also seemingly active in the streets, as Rondo No. 9 from 600 would imply in his hit song Taliban, where he raps, he'll have Bite Down smoke your top. One rumour would later circulate, suggesting that Bite Down was one of the people responsible for shooting up the funeral of Jaro City member Tutu, who was killed in 2011. Bite Down was also known by the name Bite Down two times, or simply two times, with the tradition of adding a number and an X, typically referring to the number of bodies that a member supposedly has, with Bite Down's victims, according to some rumours, being two members of MOB. It seems that Bite Down clearly had a penchant for violence. Unfortunately, in November 2016, Bite Down would end up adding several notches to his body count, and all for the wrong reasons. In the process, becoming one of the most notorious members within 600. At the time, Bite Down had been in a relationship with his girlfriend in Moni House for some time, and the couple even had one child together and were apparently expecting their second. Due to Bite Down not having his own place, he had reportedly spent time at his girlfriend's house, where the girlfriend's mother and four younger siblings also lived, including her 16 year old brother, Elijah House. However, more recently, their relationship had turned rocky due to Bite Down allegedly being both mentally and physically abusive and making Imoni's family deeply dislike him. At some point, he became unwelcome in their family home there were also some signs that Bite Down was having some mental problems. For example, in mid-October, he would tweet how he thought he was losing his head, and unfortunately, a few weeks later, that would be exactly what happened. According to later police reports, on the morning of the 2nd of November, Bite Down had entered Imoni's house, where an argument would break out between the two. During this fight, Bite Down allegedly choked Imoni and questioned her about another man that she was seeing in a sexual way. There's also redacted sections that might indicate that the child that Imoni was pregnant with wasn't in fact Bite Down's, and that another man might have been the father. Bite Down would allegedly cry and beg Imoni not to leave him before seemingly leaving the house. Later, at around 10pm that night, Bite Down would make a cryptic tweet where he says, thinking it's shake that time DT, accompanied with a red cross mark emoji. Sometime after this, Bite Down would seemingly arrive at Imoni's house again, which Imoni was seemingly aware of. However, once there, Bite Down would allegedly get into an argument with Imoni's 16-year-old brother Elijah, who had likely confronted Bite Down over how badly he was treating his sister, amid suggestions that he had previously been abusive to her. They eventually got into a full-blown fight, which Bite Down apparently lost, and seemingly blinded by rage, Bite Down would leave the house, likely to retrieve his gun from the car outside before re-entering. He would then approach Elijah with the gun, while Imoni's mother attempted to separate the two, but she was unable to stop Bite Down, who then shot Elijah. Unfortunately, Bite Down didn't stop there, and he would aim the gun at Imoni and Elijah's mother, shooting her in the back as she tried to escape. Immediately after, he aimed his gun at Imoni, shooting her as well, killing both her and the unborn child. Meanwhile, the mother, who was still alive but able to move, attempted to crawl away, but Bite Down would soon aim his gun back at her, shooting her once more in the leg, after which she played dead, finally making Bite Down leave her alone. But despite being hit multiple times, the mother would end up miraculously surviving the incident. Bite Down still hadn't had enough. At this point, likely committed to killing anybody that he deemed as a witness, he would then head upstairs, where he would also shoot Imoni's friend, who had also fortunately survived the shooting despite being hit in the neck. Bite Down would then flee the scene, leaving behind his five-month-old baby in a house with four people who had been shot, two would ultimately pass away. Luckily, even after being shot multiple times, the mother was able to get help, likely saving her and Imoni's friends' lives. Now, this is one of the most heartbreaking scenes that I've ever covered, and this goes far beyond gang violence to somebody that could have easily been the plot in a serious horror film. But this is real life with real people, and there would need to be real life consequences. Bite Down had initially got away with this, fleeing the scene without a trace. However, a few days later, a police officer noticed two men driving without wearing seatbelts and pulled them over. Bite Down would give the police a fake name, and he was miraculously allowed to leave the scene, but it seems he would have gotten away with this situation if his friend didn't choose to erratically then merge into another lane straight after the stop in front of the cops. The police then decided to go after the car to issue the driver a ticket, but when they stopped the car and told Bite Down to show his hands, he refused before taking off running. Officers believed he was armed and proceeded to tase Bite Down, finally leaving leading to his arrest, when he would ultimately be taken in and charged with multiple offences, the most serious ones being first-degree murder, attempted first-degree murder, aggravated battery by discharging a firearm, and the intentional homicide of an unborn child. However, despite this arrest taking place in 2016, Bite Down is still awaiting trial today in 2024, with many following the Chicago drill scene confused as to why this trial has taken so long. And despite the incredibly brutal nature of this crime that is frankly unforgivable, that hasn't stopped 600 members and their allies from showing blanket support for Bite Down. For example, childhood friend of his King Von would rap Free Bite Down in numerous songs such as Straight To It and Think I'm a where he would rap an ironic line saying Free Bite Down and 
that he doesn't fight. Von would even encourage female fans to get in touch with ByteDown while he was behind bars, claiming he was now single and believing that he was due to come home on bail imminently. Mimo 600 would call for ByteDown to be freed and even claimed he's innocent, writing, when a dog is cornered, it will bite, whilst adding two times, which in this context kinda looks like he's being praised for the double murder that he committed on a woman and a teenage boy. Now, the praise that ByteDown still receives from his gang is incredibly disturbing when you consider what he is actually accused of doing, but ultimately, it's no surprise. When you consider the fact that most of these young men find themselves involved in this perpetual gang war, are fully desensitized to violence, then it kind of makes sense in a very twisted way. These young men have been around death and murder for so long that something this shocking could be considered normal behavior. Bite Down himself would tweet not long before these tragic events how he had been involved in gang life since elementary. But moving into 2017, despite the dark clouds that were now all over 600, something interesting would happen as one of the rapping members, 600 Breezy, would end up being rewarded for his efforts in the music game landing himself on the radar of the most successful rapper to ever live, and for a brief moment, scoring himself and his team another opportunity to get away from the violent streets of Chicago and into the high life of the Hollywood music industry. After 600 Breezy released his breakout song Don't Get Smoked in 2014, he began getting attention from all over the music industry, but cosigns don't get much bigger than Drake. The legendary rapper, singer, and actor is quite literally the pinnacle of the rap game and pretty much the closest thing this generation has to Michael Jackson in terms of numbers on the board. And Drake was clearly a fan of 600 Breezy's music. He would play Don't Get Smoked on his sixth episode of his Apple Music show OVO Radio. This was obviously a huge opportunity for Breezy, opening the door to endless possibilities within the rap industry and giving him a chance to really take 600 to the mainstream. In an interview with XXL, 600 Breezy would explain how Drake initially tapped in and sent him a clip of himself going wild to the song Don't Get Smoked, as well as his personal phone number. From there, 600 Breezy and Drake would remain in touch, and Breezy would be seen rolling with Drake's entourage through 2015 and 2016, with Breezy even accompanying Drake on stage to accept his Billboard Music Award alongside rap legends like Lil Wayne and Nicki Minaj. In March 2017, Drake would release his highly anticipated playlist More Life, and much to the surprise of many Drill fans, at the end of track 16 on Lose You, listeners would hear a voice note from none other than 600 Breezy, who would pop up and shout out his gang. Following the release of Drake's More Life, Breezy would release the song Lou Rawls that would go on to do some serious numbers, with the music video standing today at almost 7 million views. Breezy would even end up inheriting the highly publicized beef that Drake had with XXXTentacion in the aftermath of the More Life album release, due to allegations that Drake had stolen X's flow on one of the songs, with X and Breezy eventually exchanging words in DMs, and 600 Breezy even posting videos of himself going to X's hood in Florida, seemingly showing Drake that the 600 goons were ready to slide for him all over America. Man, knock it off. Knock it off. I'm in my hotel. Hey, Broward County. Knock it off. Peacock. Hey, yo, I'm just look. I'm looking for Triple X and Passion. Y'all seen him? No? Nobody seen him? Mr. Peacocks? Ain't this his hood? Where he at? No? Nobody seen him? No? Yo! Hey, Peacock Fule! Hey, hey, have you, have you seen? Look at this big ass Peacock. This is a big ass peacock, bro. This a big ass peacock. I'm in Miami though. And we're all over in every county. You're looking for me and you talking that gangsta. And I'm blicked up. 600 Breezy was in the company of music industry titans and in a prime position to break into the mainstream rap game. However, in the end, some people believe Breezy kind of fumbled the opportunity as he ultimately would make a decision that saw him slip out of Drake's inner circle. In an interview with DJ Small's Eyes, Breezy, who had already been signed to the record label Empire since 2015, would explain that he refused to sign with Drake, claiming that he didn't want to be signed to another rapper because he believed that this would lead him to not get the shine that he deserved. Can't sign to another rapper is like, he gotta do his job too. Like, he's still rapping. You gotta sign to somebody that don't wanna be the person that you are. Like, or don't want, wanna hold you down to not get bigger than them. It's like, I always let them down the easy way. Like, like you cool, bro, but I can't sign to you. Everybody seen me with Drake all the time. I wouldn't sign to Drake, bro. Cause at the end of the day, he's still an artist. Like, if I sign to him, he's gonna sign me to him. A label, I'm gonna have some other people over it. They ain't gonna be like, I'm dealing with him. If anything, if I wanted to be like, if I can call Drake right now and be like, man, all right, I'm gonna sign to you, I, he'll sign me. So, I'm like, nah.
Moreover, Breezy would unfortunately be faced with legal issues in the months following More Life's release, with him being arrested on probation violations stemming from a 2012 drug case in Waterloo, Iowa, where Breezy had been arrested together with Stello and others for possession with intent to deliver crack cocaine, with rap magazine XXL stating that within just a matter of weeks, Breezy had gone from the stage with Drake to facing 10 years in prison. Breezy would later explain in an interview how Iowa's law enforcement had been tracking everything he had been doing since he released Don't Get Smoked, cataloging all the ways that he was violating the conditions of his parole and waiting to finally take him down. You had like, after you first put out that, that song, and, and like you had a bunch of moments around that time musically, but then it felt like your career kind of kept getting derailed by going yeah. to prison. So yeah, when did that time. start and how did that well, so, you had some crazy momentum so, going at first. So this the crazy part about it. I caught my case in Iowa in 2012, bro. Caught my case in Iowa in 2012, and I, I did a damn near a year or something and got probation. I transferred back to Illinois. So as, as I started rapping, I'm on probation in Iowa. I'm just transferred type. So I'm doing all of it, toting guns and traveling without permission like i'm doing everything that i was doing i wasn't supposed to do because i'm on probation so these people the way iowa played it they let it build up they ain't say shit. they just took everything and just created a big ass folder and when i had a month left and was finna discharge they i'll come to court so i'm thinking this you know then they all oh, no, it's a violet you you know we gonna reimpose your original sentence you can plead guilty or, or go to trial i took it to a quick little trial and they slammed my stupid ass. I did. They showed me all that, and none of that stuck. They got me off um, a dirty UA, dirty UAs. That the lady said I released you on a controlled substance case, and you continue to use a controlled substance. So my lawyer, like, what the what does that have to do with the? Like, he got caught for selling drugs, not smoking it. She like, oh, shit. she she used that to reimpose my risk. So. In 2017, bro, I went to prison with. Now I got four years and nine months over my. Was head. this because of the? All right, I think Drake won an award and you went on stage with Drake. Yeah, I went to jail two weeks after stage. that. No, I wasn't even because of that. They used that too. They just every they had every so from don't get smoked, up until Lou Rawls. Anything that I did, Iowa had that was it that they had, if I had a gun anything, Iowa had that hold it and let it build. Fortunately, things weren't all bad as Breezy would eventually catch a huge break after his lawyer would successfully file a motion for his sentence to be reconsidered, arguing that Breezy was a successful entertainer that had contributed positively towards society, and in late 2018, he was finally granted parole, hitting the streets running by releasing a new EP called First 48. But Breezy was now on thin ice as he was still on parole and any wrong move would land him back in prison. But he would keep releasing music in 2019 which would still do numbers, but not quite the same kind of hype that he was getting during his time when he first started hanging out with Drake in 2017, when he had released his big biggest hit since Don't Get Smoked, titled Lou Rawls, in the months following the release of More Life. And then, during 2020, musically would begin to slowly diminish, as did his numbers. Although Breezy would still get a few hits on outlets like Worldstar, however overall, it would seem that Breezy was beginning to transition more into a celebrity who was known for his relationships and other antics, rather than his music. However, mentally, Breezy was doing well as he would post on his Instagram in September 2021 how he had been clean off hard drugs for seven months. But unfortunately, soon Breezy was in trouble with the law once again, first in Alabama where he was arrested arrested on fugitive charges, and soon again in Iowa, where he landed back in jail once again for violating the conditions of his parole. This case would allegedly come partly as a result, Breezy engaging in yet another high-profile beef earlier that year, when he had threatened the rapper 6 9 after he had dissed King Von, who had famously been killed at the end of 2020 after the fight with Quando Rondo. You gon' die. Yo, listen, you die. haven't killed nobody that you killed You gon' die. die. You, you gon' die. You gon' die. And that's all I, I'm gonna I'm gonna go to jail respectfully. Yo, why did oh, I'm gonna go to jail respectfully when I see you respectfully. I'm not me. And you, you and you gotta gone. move around with security because you a. You gotta move around with security because you a. You gotta move around with security. Real street. Move and take security guards. You a. You gon' die. You gon' die. You gon' die. Your security guards better be strapped all that. You both these dead ass. You can the You the pussy. And that's why Rondo. You a. You got the whole hood. Stupid down. You a. You a. You ain't even got. You can't even. Because you ain't got no hood. You. You gon' die. 
But already in February 2022, Breezy would be back out posting the paperwork that he claimed showed that 6 9 was directly snitching on him. He would keep dropping music during 2022, but by and large, it seemed like the superstardom that Breezy was close to stepping in five years earlier had now diminished, with one Facebook post from April 2023 even insinuating that Breezy had even returned to selling drugs, as he claimed his customers would repeatedly ask him when he was dropping new music when they came to pick up packs. But fortunately, it seems that Breezy's mental health has since improved and he's back to dropping music again, as well as seemingly staying on good terms with at least some of 600 as he would do a No Jumper interview with another 600 rapper Mimo in late 2023, opening up about his past struggles and future plans. Who knows the possible heights he could have reached if he signed to OVO and used his Drake sign to further his career. But regardless, Breezy still claims that him and Drake are loyal friends, and even after choosing not to sign with OVO, he's still been seen working with them, for example promoting their clothing line. And perhaps he feels that even if he maybe left money and some big career moves on the table, he kept his integrity intact and made the move that was true to who he was. But while 600 Breezy was grappling with the allure of signing away his soul to another rapper in the music industry in 2017, that year the violence in the streets would reach new heights, as 600 affiliates from nearby O Block would have become embroiled in a new chapter of Chicago's gang wars, with one of their most beloved members, T Roy, ultimately being killed by their ops, with O Block and 600 launching a brutal revenge campaign and giving their alliance a new nickname that would go on to become infamous in the Chicago streets for years to come. Of course, I'm talking about Get Back Gang.